This is Books of Titans, the podcast dedicated to the influences of influencers. The books that have helped shape prominent inventors, business leaders, athletes, intellectuals, scientists, and others. We'll talk about what makes these books such classics and at least attempt to have an intelligent discussion about what makes them so important and influential. Hello, this is Eric Rostad coming to you from Spring Hill, Tennessee, which is right outside of Nashville. Today, I'm covering a book called Living with a Seal, 31 Days Training with the Toughest Man on the Planet. It's a book by Jesse Itzler. This episode is going to contain three segments. The first segment will just be a brief introduction to the book, the impact it's had on me, how the book's structured, how I heard about it originally, that kind of thing. Segment two will be three key mindset takeaways, three lessons from the from the book that uh, I, th- I think can can help you in, in how you approach training, life, relationships. And the third segment will be the one thing, the one key takeaway from this book. So first off, I am completely breaking protocol here, and I'm going to cover a book that has not been part of any of the Books of Titans reading lists. And in fact, I read this book before I even started the Books of Titans project in 2017. So I read this book in, I believe, April of 2016. And the reason I want to cover it is, is that it is one of the nine books that have changed my life. I have a, a blog post on the Books of Titans website that highlights all nine of those books. So I'll link to that in the show notes and you can you can take a look at the other ones as well. But But this is one of them. And... I would go so far as to say the the entire Books of Project project Books of Titans project may never have happened had it not been for me reading this book. It 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 affected my mindset so much. So I'm going to go into a lot of that in this in this episode. But here's a basic premise for this book. Ima- imagine this scenario: you're a 40 plus year old married man with a kid. You enjoy running and working out, and in the process of being involved in running events, you meet a Navy SEAL. You're so impressed by this Navy SEAL that you invite him to live with you, your wife, and your child for one month on the condition that you'll do whatever he asks you to do for that entire month. That is the imp- the, that's the, the, the premise of this book. And I want to read the introduction to get a, a little more a little more info from Jesse on on why he did this. So here here we go. People ask me why I hired SEAL. One answer is this. When it comes to physical fitness, I tend to be a creature of habit. I like routine. And routine can be good, especially when it comes to working out. But routine can also be a rut. Many of us live our lives on autopilot. We do the same thing every day. Wake up, go to work, come home, have dinner, repeat. I found myself drifting in that direction. It was as if cruise control settings had been set and I wasn't improving. I wanted to get off it. SEAL had something I wanted, but I just wasn't sure what it was. So this book takes place in December of 2010. And at that time, Itzler was 42 years old. Jesse Itzler is a, an entrepreneur. He's got a string of, of successful businesses He's married to Sarah Blakely. She started Spanx, which is a, a billion dollar company, is made made her a billionaire in the process. Uh, and the book takes place mostly between New York, Connecticut, and Atlanta, where where Jesse and Sarah have have different houses. And so Seal is with them the entire time, uh, except for a brief weekend away to run a race. But uh Seal goes to these different houses, goes to all the business meetings, goes to, is there for family family time, and and so, in addition to to seeing the physical challenges that Seal encourages Jesse to partake of, uh, we get we get a lot of insight into these business meetings and, and Jesse's life, and it's a very entertaining book. Uh, each chapter starts with a one liner from Seal, and these can range from uh, it's not piss time, it's run time. To if you're hungry, run faster. You'll be home quicker. 
And these one-liners are great because you know that they're going to pop up in that chapter. And so you're just kind of waiting for, okay, what's, what's the context of this one going to be? And so the, the book is set up as, as basically a day-by-day journal of workouts, lessons, mindset, uh, business meetings, family life. It's, it's hilarious. It's very entertaining. I, I remember laughing quite a bit while I read this book. And then each chapter, which covers a day, uh, one of the 31 days of the month, each chapter ends with a workout summary for that day. So how much they ran, how many pull-ups, push-ups, and all that kind of stuff that they, that they did. The way I heard about this book is that it was suggested in an Entre Leadership podcast. That's a, a podcast put on by the Dave Ramsey group. And it's also the title of, of a book by Dave Ramsey. But uh, in that podcast, they they interviewed Jesse, which must have been early 2016. And I just remember hearing the story and, okay, you you invited a Navy SEAL into your house for a month and did whatever he told you to do. That is insane. I've I've got to read this book. I've got to find out about that. So I did. And the book had an immediate impact on my life in multiple ways, uh, but he, here's a few. One is in the area of running. I've I have run my entire life. But what's funny is if I look at a graph of running for that year in 2016, it's just kind of the lines just kind of steadily going up until April. And then I read the book and then the line just shoots up and it's, it starts going like straight up. And after reading this book, I started running like crazy. I also bought this book for a good friend of mine, and his dad is actually a Navy SEAL. And so I thought it might be a, a good way for, for my friend to, to relate more to his dad or, or just kind of, uh, I guess, understand the, the, his mindset of, of, of being a SEAL. And I, I'm not sure if, 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 it, if it did help in that realm at all, but my friend started running. And he's always been an athlete. He's been a basketball player, but he had never been a runner. But he started running. And with a few, within a few months of reading the book, he was he was challenging me to do a marathon. I'd never done a marathon. Uh, I'd never run uh, anything longer than than eight or nine miles. And here here he is challenging me to do a marathon with him. And we ended up doing it. We 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 did it with another friend. We we flew out to L.A. Uh, Los Angeles and and did the 2017 Los Angeles Marathon. And it was all a, a direct result of of reading this book. And my friend changed a lot of things in his life from the, from this book. He changed his diet. He he started running, uh, changed time he would go to bed and all that just just because of this this one book. So when I saw that it impacted me to a large degree, and, and again I'll get into a, a lot of the other ways uh, later on in this pot this episode, but it to to also see it impact my friend, I knew I knew there was something special about it. So before we head into to segment two, you'll notice I've used seal the entire time. And I, I, I haven't said the seal's name. And in the book, Jesse Itzler doesn't use his name either. And it, 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 there's a reason he doesn't in the book. It's to, to protect his, uh, his, his name at that point. He does later on reveal it. And so if you get a new version of the book, the, his name is in there. And, and I'll, I'll reveal it in, in segment three of this episode as well. You probably already know who it is, but uh, I, I'll just conceal it as well. But after I read the book, I actually had to Google Google it to see who, who it was. I do want to put one warning out there. If if you are sensitive to language, I, I'm not going to use any language in this episode. Uh, we, we want to keep that non-explicit writing. But this book is is like a, a seal likes to, to consider all the different ways he can use the F word in all different kinds of formats. So if, if you're sensitive to that, to that, you will not like this book. And so just want to put that out as a warning. If this is your first time listening to the podcast, welcome. The Books of Titans project is based around the idea of having a yearly reading list and attempting to, to find the best books out there. I try to help you with that by, by sharing reading lists, by sharing my reading list, but I've also opened up the Books of Titans website now for you to share your yearly reading list. So for just $9 a month, you can submit the books that you're reading. I'll put them up on the website into a visually stunning format, a format that you can take screenshots of and share on, on social platforms. 
And then you'll get access to the back end of the website to be able to, to write reviews, rate the books, and share when you started reading it, when you finished it, and even share the reason for reading that book in the first place. You'll get your own URL. It'll be booksoftitans.com forward slash your name. And if you want to see what it'll look like, you can go to booksoftitans.com forward slash Stuart dash Browning. I'll link to this in the show notes, but Stuart shared his list. And not only did he share his 2019 reading list, but he shared all the way back to 2005. And it's just been a joy to look at, at his books. It's a lot of books I haven't heard of. I can't wait to ask him about some of them. And I can't wait to see his reviews for, for his books that he reads this year. So if you want more details, you can go to booksoftitans.com forward slash my books. I have three options available. And again, they start at just $9 a month. So now back to the book. I want to highlight three parts of the book that dealt specifically with mindset issues. I have a quote for each section, and then I'll dig into it a little deeper. So section one here, I'm going to title that pull-ups. So when Seal arrives in New York City in December of 2010, he goes to Jesse Itzler's Park Avenue apartment right on Central Park. And he goes in there and he says, all right, we're going, we're going running. And so they go off and they do a six mile run and then they get back to the apartment and, and seal goes, okay, where's, where's the gym. And so they go down to the gym and seal says, give me 10 pull-ups. And Jesse, I guess is feeling good. And, and he, he struggles, but, uh, he gets all the way up to 17 pull-ups and then seal goes, we're going to stay here until you get a hundred. And Jesse goes, that's impossible. Well, 90 minutes later, he finally did get to a hundred. That was their first day together. And it, it's, it really sets the tone for the whole book. If you think back to your life, the teachers, the coaches, the, the people that have had the biggest impact on you are those who have gotten you past where you thought you could go. They took you past what you thought were your limits. And I thought that was amazing that that was the first thing that Seal did with Jesse. Jesse's struggling to get 17 pull-ups and he says, no, you can do 100. And Jesse doesn't even think he can, he can get close to that. And he does, and it's painful, and he does one at a time, and he's doing laps around the, the gym in between just to try to shake out his arms. His arms are in pain. Uh, his biceps are in pain for the next few days. But he did it, and, and, and it pushed Jesse past that point of what he thought he could do, and it pushed him way beyond. You know, from 17 to 100, that's, that's a huge jump. But that, that really sets the tone for the entire book. The second one is what I call the cold, and I'm going to uh, just read through a, an exchange they had, they had here, and it starts with, with Jesse talking. It's 14 degrees outside, I say, and Seal says, to you it's 14 degrees, because you're telling yourself it's 14 degrees. No, no, it, it really is. It's 14 degrees. Like, that's the actual real temperature outside. It says so on my computer. Seal pauses for a moment, like I may have disappointed him. On your computer, huh? He begins to laugh, but it's a haunting laugh, like the count on Sesame Street. The temperature is what you think it is, bro, not what your computer thinks it is. If you think it's 14 degrees, then it's 14 degrees. Personally, I'm looking at it like it's in the mid-50s. Rather than argue, after all, we're, just, we're still getting to know each other. I just say, got it. You ever spend any time in freezing water, Jesse? Seal asks. I'm thinking to myself, like on purpose? But I respond with a, no. Well, is it freezing? Or is your mind just saying it's freezing? Which is it? He laughs again. Control your mind, Jesse. Got it. I'm going to have to put that on my to-do list. Control mind. Exactly. Enjoy this. If you want it to be 70 and sunny, it's 70 and sunny. Just run. The elements are in your mind. I don't ever check the temperature when I run. Who cares what the temperature on the computer says? The computer isn't out there running, is it? And I, I just, I love that exchange. And 
it's uh, so so one way this is I've kind of taken this is I started taking cold showers shortly after reading this book. It, it wasn't a result of this book. They don't suggest that. Seal doesn't ever mention that in the book. Uh, I may have gotten that actually from from uh, Tools of Titans, but I started taking cold showers and the first week was horrible. It, it felt like I was getting hit in the chest with a metal baseball bat while simultaneously having a bag placed over my head so that I couldn't breathe. But I have taken cold showers every single morning since then. And it's gotten to the point where they feel, they actually feel warm. I don't, I don't lose my breath when I, when I go into the cold shower anymore, but that first week was, was very painful and it helped, but it, it really helped me see kind of what was going on in this exchange. Now, when I take a cold shower, I'm, I'm not thinking that it's a cold shower. Uh, I, I don't even really know that it's a cold shower anymore. And it doesn't, it doesn't make me lose my thought or my breath anymore. And so that's a shift in mindset and I've, I've gotten used to it and all that as well, but, but it was really a shift of mindset. And even this morning in, in Spring Hill here, I, I ran, I went outside and, and ran and it, it was 17 degrees. And so just a, a little warmer than, uh, in, than the 14 degrees that they ran in, but I was in shorts and a long t- sleeve t-shirt. And it's something I make a practice of. I, I, I even like in the winter, I'll, I'll wear shorts a lot of the time. And just to try to get in that mindset of, of it's cold if I think it's cold. And, and it really is like I'll shiver more if, if I'm thinking in my head, okay, I'm, I'm going to be cold if I'm going outside right now. But if, it's, if I just go and don't think about it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's amazing how that, that works. Another way I've seen this work is last year I dramatically changed my mile per minute, my time per minute uh, in, in running. And I, I mean, for like the past 10 years, I've, I've been steady at a certain time and I have dropped nearly 45 seconds per mi- per, per mile since last year. And it happened because of one thing I was at a, I was at a retreat and there was a, another runner there. And, and so I, su- I suggested, Hey, let's, let's run together, uh, in the morning and so we did. And this guy was, this guy was older than me and he just, he destroyed me. I mean, he ran so fast, you know, no, no problem breathing or talking while he was running or anything. And I'm just, I'm dying. And I think I'm in good shape. I think I'm a, a fast runner and, he, and he's just destroying me. And I ran with him once. And since then I've dropped 45 seconds per mile, just simply again, uh, a mindset thing. Like I was, I was able to run with him and, and there's no reason I shouldn't be able to run faster. And I have since then. And so it's been really amazing to me. You know, I can go for 10 years and not, not improve. And then just one run with one person can, can completely shift that mindset. So the, it's cold thing, the, the 14 degrees, it's, it's in your mind that, that can go a lot of different ways. And it's, it's been interesting to see it in, in my life since reading this book and, and how mindset has, can, can really limit, limit me. And, and it goes back to that pull-ups thing as well. If, if you think you can only do 17 and that's a struggle for you, you know, there's no way you're ever going to consider a hundred. So the third mindset thing I want to highlight here is, is what I call daily habits. And this, the quote I'm going to highlight from seal here is not from this book, but it's in a podcast interview that I, that I heard of him. And one day he said he was, he was running on the road and this car kind of slowly pulled up to him and it actually kind of freaked him out because he didn't know what was going to happen if he was going to get robbed or, or what. And, uh, and the person driving the car said, what are you training for? And Seal responded with life. <laughs> I, I, I love that. That's, that is my, that's my favorite quote from, from Seal. Because he could have said, I mean, he, he probably was training for a, a particular race. He was probably had a hundred mile race coming up, but he didn't mention that. He said life. And throughout this book, we see everything that SEAL does is related to life. It's, it's related to training. It's related to his daily habits. And he, he doesn't view a run 
as just one one thing. He views it as part of that daily habit, that daily set of training that trains you not just for a race, but for life. And that's a really amazing way to consider everything that you do. Yes, it, it can apply to running, but it, it can apply to your marriage. It can apply to every interaction you have with your wife. They're, they're all important. It can apply to how you relate to your kids. It can apply to your work. It can apply to every hour of your work. You know, it's not, it's not just the end, the end goal, which is, is something I've always looked at the end goal without maybe taking a step back to think about what are the daily things that are are leading to that. So this book really set off a, a, a deep interest in, in pursuing daily habits, daily rituals. And because of that, a lot of things in my life have changed just from viewing things from that perspective of what are daily habits I can do. So maybe not even setting goals per se, but but more, all right, if I do have this goal, it's got to be matched with a daily habit or it's not going to happen. So what daily habit needs to take place for, for me to reach that? And that just, it, this, that comes out over and over in this book. Each workout is important. What are you training for? Life. So now into segment three of the one thing, my one key takeaway from this book. The one thing that I want to leave you guys with as, as listeners of the podcast and the thing I, I hope to to have always stick in my head about this book. And I'm going to read the quote uh, because the one thing comes directly from this quote that is from Seal. When you think you're done, you're only at 40% of what your body is capable of doing. That's just the limit that we put on ourselves. And that is an incredible statement. And it's an incredible statement coming from Seal. Uh, right after this, I'm going to read the epilogue of the book and, and share some of what Seal has done in his life. And if anyone is, should know or would know the limit of the human body, it's, it's this man, it's this Seal. And for him to say that, I mean, just think back to your life, uh, the times you've run or, or done some physical exertion where at the end of it, say, say it's a mile run and you're, you feel like you've given your all, Seal said you are only at 40% of what your body is capable of doing. You still have 60% left to give. And it just, it doesn't seem possible especially if, if you've done an event like that where you have you have absolutely given your all and you f- you feel like you left everything out there for him to say that you still have 60% i mean it, it at least gets you thinking doesn't it and that's that's really what this book did it it pushed me beyond what i thought i could do and it was similar to another book i i had read about running before this which was born to run and in that book you learn about people doing a hundred mile races. And I, I had never heard of that before reading Born to Run. I'd never heard of anything even close to that amount. I mean, I thought a marathon was just an insane distance at that point. And, and these ultra marathons are four and five marathon lengths. But there's a lot of power in, the, in these types of books that push you beyond what you think you can do or what you even know of out there. And, and this is what this book was for me. I want to read parts of the epilogue. And at the very end of the epilogue is where the seal is revealed and and who it is. So stick with me here. And I'm sure you already know who it is, but, um, here's a little insight into Goggins life. And again, this is the epilogue. If you get a later version of the book, uh, when, when the seal is finally revealed, in 2005, after being deployed to Iraq, SEAL was sent stateside for free fall parachute training. During that time, he learned that a Chinook helicopter carrying several SEALs with whom he went through BUDS training took on enemy fire in Kunar, Kunar province. Everyone on board was killed. These heroes were on their way to rescue four SEALs on a mission called Operation Red Wings. And 
I'm taking myself out of this quote for a minute. Operation Red Wings, if you're familiar with Lone Survivor, that's the story of that movie. So SEAL knew a lot of those, a lot of the SEALs on on that mission who were killed, and it, it had a tremendous impact on him. So back back into the quote or back into the epilogue here. Soon after SEAL heard the news, he decided to raise money in consciousness for the families of the fallen soldiers. Rather than have a bake sale or host a golf outing, SEAL googled the 10 most difficult athletic feats in the world. His plan was to compete in the world's toughest races for his cause. The organization SEAL chose to raise money for is the Special Operations Warrior Foundation, which gives college scholarships and grants to the children of fallen Special Operations soldiers. SEAL's first race was the Badwater Badwater 135, the 135-mile race in Death Valley that I mentioned earlier in this book. When he called the race director, director to register, the race director insisted SEAL first run 100 miles in 24 hours or less to qualify. Four days later, SEAL was at the starting line of a 24-hour race in San Diego. He had never run more than 20 miles in his life, but this was the only sanctioned race he could do in time to qualify for Badwater. During the, the race, SEAL, who weighed over 250 pounds at the time, broke several metatarsals in both feet and suffered kidney failure due to his size and lack of nutrition. By mile 70, he was urinating blood and could barely walk. What did SEAL do? He got up off his chair and ran another 30 miles. He completed 101 miles in 19 hours on his broken bones while experiencing kidney failure. He experienced, he, he refused all medical attention after the race. And again, taking myself out of this epilogue, that was the race that Jesse Itzler met SEAL. And Jesse went there with four or five friends. So they, they were going to do this 100-mile race as a relay. And they were going to... Uh, so each each person would run 25 or 20 miles or so, depending on how many people there were. But SEAL showed up by himself. So he, he showed up to run 100 miles by himself. And this wasn't like 100 miles through beautiful terrain. This was 100 miles around a track. So four laps per mile in the same circle for, for SEAL for 19 hours. And just in a, I've, I've heard him on podcasts say that that was the hardest thing he had ever done in his life, even worse than, than, uh, than SEAL Hell Week. Now back to the epilogue. Three weeks later... And with his feet not yet healed, he ran the Las Vegas Marathon in three hours and eight minutes, qualifying him for the Boston Marathon. Just weeks later, Seal completed the Hurt 100, one of the hardest 100-mile trail races in the world. It was then that the Badwater race director granted him entry. Six months later, Seal placed fifth in the toughest foot race in the world, Badwater 135 in Death Valley. Four months after Badwater, Seal completed the Ultraman World Championship in Hawaii. Uh, skipping ahead, over the following years, SEAL completed, competed in, in about 50 ultra-marathon, ultra-endurance races and has had top five finishes in at least 20 of them. In 2007, he returned to Badwater and placed third. He started the Ironman in Kona by parachuting into the water. He's been on the covers of and profiled in Runner's World and Outside Magazine. The Navy has used him in recruiting commercials, and he made an appearance on NBC's Today where he tried to best the Guinness 24-hour pull-up record on on uh, of 4,021 pull-ups. He did 2,588 of them before tearing a muscle in his forearm. Four months later, in January 2013, Seal set the Guinness World Record with 4,030 pull-ups completed in 17 hours. Seal is widely considered to be the toughest athlete on the planet. His name is David. Goggins. David Goggins, or as they call him on the Team Never Quit podcast, Goggins. So yeah, after reading after reading the book, uh, uh, again, the, it, the version I read did not have the epilogue, so I, I did some Google searches and found out who the seal was, and then have kind of been obsessed ever since then, and have just tried to listen to any podcast that, that Goggins has been on. And it just, I get fired up and, and again, I mean, the book has, has just had a, a really big impact, especially with running and daily habits, mindset, that, that sort of thing. Goggins just came out with his own book 
in December of 2018. It's called Can't Hurt Me. It's on my reading list for this year, and it's towards the end, so I'll probably be getting to it in um, October or November of this year. I have two goals for 2019, and one of those goals is to run with David Goggins. If you if you know of any way that I can get a run in with Goggins, let me know. I I live in the same city as him, so it's it's not entirely out of the realm of possibility here. And I also run fast enough to uh, to where I know I'd I'd be able to to run with him. Uh, and it's not anything I want to prove by running with him, but I I would not be the runner I am. I wouldn't be the person I am. If it, if it weren't for Goggins. And so it's just really a desire to, to share some time by running. So I, uh, I emailed Jesse Itzler after I read the book, told him the impact it had on me. And he emailed me with, or he emailed me a copy of the book and signed it. And it said, Eric, get uncomfortable. Enjoy. So that's what I want to leave you with. I want to leave you with Stay uncomfortable. Get get uncomfortable. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. Before I sign off, just a reminder that you can now share your own reading list on the Books of Titans website by going to booksoftitans.com, my books, forward slash my books. The link will be in the show notes, so you can just click that. You can also follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter at Books of Titans. If you haven't already done so, you can subscribe to this podcast and find all our past episodes through iTunes, the Android Marketplace, or your podcast manager of choice. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please rate it. Please tell your friends about it. Tell your friends about particular episodes, your favorites. I'll be back next week with another book. And until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep listening. I'm out.